Nice sound. Okay, so here's our goal today. Again, we're talking about all these different angles that interact when we have secant lines, tangent lines, angles that are inside a triangle or inside a circle, outside a circle, and all that sort of stuff. There's a key feature on this example right here. These are not exterior. There's the stuff that we've learned before. There's a key feature on that first one that we've got to recognize. Somebody want to tell us what it is? Sai, what do we got to recognize? We got to recognize the radius right here. So if this is 12, that's 12, which makes this 20. And then we'd have to assume, I guess we can assume here, if this is a tangent, that's a right angle. And then we can use the Pythagorean theorem. So I'm going to write leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared. So that's going to be 20 squared. So this is going to be x squared plus 144. And 20 squared, probably don't need a calculator for that. That's going to be 400. I'm going to subtract 144 from that, and that's going to give me, correct me if I'm wrong, 256, yes, which should ring a bell. Take the square root of both sides, and I end up with x equals 16. Um, Caleb, can you tell us why we don't put the negative? Uh, because the side, the radius can't be negative. Yeah, radius can't be negative. We're talking real lengths here, real distances on this one. Okay, we've got an external point W. And it comes over here and it touches the circle at this point and it touches the circle at this point right here. So it touches, those are points of tangency, P and Q. Crew, can you tell us something we know about the lengths of those sides? They're the same. <laughs> they are the same. Can you tell us why? Uh, because... Do you remember this business right here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that part right there, we've got two triangles that are congruent. That means these two correspond, corresponding sides would be congruent. So x plus 10 would equal 3x minus 6. Pretty easy equation to solve, so I'm going to move that to the other side. So that's going to be a plus 6. So I get 16 equals 2x. x equals 8, is that right? Yes, yes. Okay, all right, perfect. Okay, somebody raise their hand and tell us, what do we write down for this one? And can you kind of describe the theorem that we're using here? We saw this one yesterday. This one was a little funky. It's cool that it works the way it does. And it's also cool that you don't have to worry about triangles. You're just worrying about pieces of sides, pieces of chords. Samara. I did 8 times 6 equals 8 times 7. Very good. If you multiply these two pieces, so whenever you've got chords that intersect each other, um, the product of the two pieces of one chord equal the product of the two pieces of the other chord. So we have 8 times 6 equals 3x times x. So we get 48 equals 3x squared. So I'm going to divide this, and I get 16 equals x squared, and then I take the square root. Um, wait a minute. Isn't that one of the four techniques for solving a quadratic? What's this called? Taking the square root. Okay. What are the other three? Square root property. We can take the square root. What's another one, Si? Complete the square. The quadratic formula and the last one, probably the best one if it works, Colson, factoring. Okay, we've got factoring the quadratic formula, we've got completing the square, and we've got square root property if it works. Any questions, Mason? Um, the, the two the lengths of the arcs bisecting each other. Uh -huh. there, there's a proof for that, isn't there? Uh, there is. We we kind of ran through it yesterday. If you take a look oh, in the notes, right. yep. We had uh, corresponding parts of similar triangles. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at this. We're interested in knowing about external angles. We've done angles on the inside. We've done inscribed. We've done central angles, different things like that. So here's what an external angle is. It's no surprise. It's made by intersecting tangent or secant lines whose vertex is outside, hence exterior. The vertex has got to be on the outside. So remember, a tangent intersects the circle at only one point, and a secant intersects the circle at two points. Okay, that's what makes it a secant. That, that's what the difference is between the two of those. So this is the external angle theorem. Okay, and by the time we're done with this, at the very end, we're going to kind of put all these pieces that we've been talking about, different types of angles. So the measure of an external angle is blank the difference of the larger intercepted arc minus the smaller inter intercepted arc. Anybody want to take a guess at what it is? Especially based on what we did yesterday? What do you think, Samara? It is. Okay. 
it's half the difference of the larger intercepted arc minus the smaller intercepted arc. So if we take a look at this one right here, I've got three different cases. If we have two secants, so again, these secants, they meet at this point, this external point A. This one crosses over here. This one crosses over here. So we've got this smaller arc right here that's BC, and we've got this larger arc because it's further away. It cuts out a bigger uh, arc of the circle. So it's going to be the big one minus the small one, and it's going to be exactly half that. So if I take this lower secant and I just happen to slide it down so it's now a tangent, I've got this arc right here and I've got this arc right here. But the theorem is still true. The measure of this angle is going to be exactly half of the measure of the big arc. So that's going to be arc DC minus the measure of the small arc. That's the one that's closer to it. So that's going to be BC. And again, it's the big one minus the small one. I'll write that one more time, and then you can just kind of keep that in mind. Then if I take this secant and I slide it up here, so now I've got two tangents. I've got this arc right here from B to C. I've got this arc right here from B to C also, but you'll notice that it's a huge arc. It's more than 180 degrees. So that means it's a major arc, so that means I need to use all three of those letters in order to name it. So I'm going to write one half. And then I'm going to call on somebody. Tell me what to write. Wilson. B, D, C. Measure okay. Of Measure of B, D, C. And then you drop the arc. Oh, Got to okay. put an arc over the top of it. Let me make that look right. Okay. So this is going to be measure of B, D, C minus, Keely, what's the other part? Um, the measure of B, C. Measure of B, C. And we don't need three letters on that because it's a minor one. We've, we've described it. Take a look at what happens here. When you have two tangents, it takes all 360 degrees, and we've covered it, uh, part of it with the big piece and the other part of the 360 degrees with the small piece. That's not the case with the other two. Okay? We don't know how many degrees are left out by these arcs up here and here. Okay? All right. Any questions? Okay. Let me slide this down here. It says find the value of x using the exterior angle theorem. And it does give us a little help here. It says, assume that lines appear to be tangent, are tangent. That is generally the case. They normally don't try and sneak something in on you and show you that, oh, no, I'm sorry, that actually hit in two points, not one point. So we have two secants here. So the measure of this angle. Does it still matter if they're secants or tangents or whatever? It's just no, it doesn't. It's just the big arc minus the small arc. So it's going to be half of 120 minus 54. So that's... That's 66, right? Half of 66. So we end up with 33 degrees. Is that right? Okay. Look at this one. Okay, I heard somebody say if they feel like they're lacking information, but I gave you a hint just a second ago. Do not say anything out loud. Hey, we only have one arc, but they're both tangents, which means this hits right here at B, and this hits right here at C, which means if this one is X, do not say anything out loud, you actually do know the length of this outside one. Don't, don't say anything out loud. Let everybody think for a second. If you know this one is X, you may not know the number that this is, but you could figure out an expression that represents what it is. Okay, Lizzie appears to be the happiest in the class right now. I'm going to ask her, Lizzie, what can you use to express this? Well, the whole circle is 360 degrees. Uh -huh. So then you say, take 360 minus X, and then that's the fourth of the rest of the circle. Very good. And that doesn't seem like it helps us very much because it's like, well, wait a minute. That doesn't really help. Because I don't know either of them, but remember what the theorem says. It says that this angle right here, which is 30 degrees, is exactly half of the big one, which is this outer one right here, that major arc. So 360 minus X is the big one. Minus the small one, which is X. And do we have an equation with one variable? We do. Now we can solve it. 
We're going to solve this by clearing the fractions. So this is going to be 60 equals. This would be 360 minus 2x. And lo and behold, we're going to get a pretty nice answer to this. Because if I subtract 360, I get minus 300, which starts to freak us out a little bit, especially when we've been talking about the fact that, hey, these measurements have to be positive by the time we're done plugging them in. But if I divide both sides by negative 2, I end up with x equals 150, and x is right here. So this is 150 degrees, and then you could figure out the other one. The other one would have to be 210. Okay? Again, what should be at least mildly interesting and should be kind of cool about this is the fact that we had a tiny piece of information about this. We used our brains and we figured out, well, wait a minute. I can write this down, and then I can write down some algebra that actually solves it, and lo and behold, everything works out perfectly. Sorry. Um, no. If you want to do that on a test and this is worth 10 points, I might give you one point. Okay? And what if I made, what if I made, the, what if the answer was um, 151.3? Yeah. Yeah. Okay? All right. Now. You could if you wanted to, so I'm going to erase this. The answer on this one's 150 degrees. Can you think of another way to solve B using central angles and triangles and stuff like that? If you did that, this would now be a central angle. That would be a right angle, and this, um, this right here, would be one half of x, okay? And then you can kind of go forward from there and find all the other pieces, all right? Flip the page over. I'm gonna give you about a 15 second head start and then I'm gonna ask people, hey, what do you think about this one? Tell me what to write down. Dane, what do you got? Tell me what to write down. So somebody looking at it would know that you know exactly what you're doing. They, they oh. have some justification here. Tell me what to write. Uh, it's like one and a half, 380 minus 40. Okay. And that's what X would be, right? Mm -hmm. So this is one half of happens to be 40. So X is 20 degrees. Raise your hand if you got that. Okay. Perfect. Um, I'm going to call on... Give you 15 seconds and then I'm going to call on somebody. Crew, oh. how do we do B? Uh, it's going to be 50 okay. equals one half of X or 360 minus X. Okay, the key is, again, like we showed before, the big one is 360 minus, whoops, 360 minus X, minus. and then we subtract the small one, okay? Same thing. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Wow. Nice. I got uh, 130, is that right? Is that what you got? Okay. Um, if you were asked to do more than find X, if you were asked to find out what that arc was over here, again, same type of thing. We can just do the subtraction. We can figure out what's left of the 360 degrees. Everybody good? You got 15 seconds. Keely, what do you think on this one? Um, it's going to be one half of something. What's it going to be one half of? It's a big one minus a small one, right? Yeah. Do you know the big one? Do you know the small one? 35. So Keely's doing something on her calculator. Everybody here ought to know what she's doing because you've either done this or you're with us and you're thinking it through. How on earth do I find that big arc? What is it? How'd you get it?
Okay, 105 plus 160 plus 35. So we add all those together. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's going to be 300. 300. And then you want to change your answer on that one? Then it's going to be 60 degrees. Okay, so this arc over here has got to be 60 degrees. Now we can just take half of 25. Sal, you want to guess and check? No. Okay. 25 halves, 12.5, anything like that. It is in degrees. So on something like this, I need everybody to listen carefully. We normally stress, you know, uh, fractions and accuracy and stuff like that. If this is a problem about degrees, somebody probably does not want to hear, hey, the answer is 12, 25 half degrees. They'd probably want to say the answer is 12.5 degrees. So we'd probably write it like that. Good? Okay. All right. Last one, and then we're going to do a little bit of an exploration. Um, I'm going to ask Luke. Is this a tough one? No. Tell me what to write down. Um, so because X is vertical angles with uh, that angle there, mm -hmm. then you just saw about like the right one. 190 minus 70 is 20. Half of 20 is 10. So X equals 10. X equals 10. Perfect. Raise your hand if you got that figured out. Perfect. Okay. The last thing I want to do here is kind of put all of these together. We've been talking the last couple of days about how these lines or chords or tangents and different things like that, how they interact with circles and angles and segments and everything. As far as angles go, I want you to take a look at this. If it's a central angle, absolute piece of cake. Now in this, we've got angle one and then angle the lowercase a and the lowercase b, they're going to stand for the measure of the arc. So if this is angle one and it's a central angle, the measure of that angle is exactly the same as a. Nothing fancy about it. If we take that angle and slide it back just a little bit, so it's not a central angle, it's an angle formed by two intersecting chords, then we have to use a different formula. What's the formula? Look at the picture. What's the formula? Psi. Yep, it's going to be A plus B. Okay, you add those together. Okay, if we move it all the way over here so that the vertex isn't on the inside at all, it's right on the edge. So we call that an inscribed angle. What's the formula now? Caleb, what do you got? It's exactly half of that arc that it intercepts. So it's going to be half of A. Okay. So if it's here, it's A. If it's inside, it's half of these two arcs added together. And if it's right on the, on the edge, if it's an inscribed angle, then it's exactly half of the arc. Then we take a look at this one. This is now on the outside. So we've moved from the center, vertex right at the center, vertex still inside, vertex right on the edge to the vertex outside. And once the vertex is outside, it's still kind of the same, but something changes. Zach? So you do A minus B, one half of A minus B. So. Yes, one half of A minus B. We take half of the big one minus the small one. And then this is still on the outside. Even if one of them is a tangent, doesn't make any difference. It's still going to be one half of the big one minus the small one. And there we go. Okay, any questions? Okay, I'm going to ask Lizzie, because I know Lizzie figured this out last time, but everybody else should have this down. Lizzie, if this big outside one is X, how can I represent the measure of that small intercepted arc? Um, 360, minus 360 minus X, okay? Which means that exterior angle of 84 should be exactly half of the big one minus the small one. So the big one is X minus the small one of 360 minus x and then we just solve that and we're all set to go there is a problem here do not say anything out loud i want you to look at it crew look at this there's a problem with that this is the big one minus that one's the small one there is a huge problem and people do this all the time it's a tiny detail that starts coming up in seventh grade when we've got quantities that we're adding or subtracting adding no big deal 
subtracting the order when you subtract things makes a gigantic difference. And if you're not subtracting a quantity, take a look at this. Inside the parentheses, it looks like there are three things, an X, a 360, and another X. There are not three things, and how should we make it look like there are not three things? What's the right way to do this? Luke, what do you got? You just add a second parenthesis. You do. What do you put it around? Uh, you put uh, it around the 360 minus X. You put it around this one right here, because then it is this quantity minus this quantity right here. And if you don't do that, the X's cancel out. If you do that, then you end up distributing through. It ends up with a minus 360 and a plus X. Then you've got the 2X and everything works out. When we did it the other way, when the X was on the inside and we had X minus 360 minus X, or take that back, it was the other way around. The big one was 360 minus X and then minus X. Does putting parentheses around the first one make any difference on this? No, because what's in front of it is a plus or nothing, okay? But in front of that one, you're subtracting the entire quantity. So you want to make sure you're careful with that when you're subtracting more than when the quantity is expressed in terms of more than one thing, you got to make sure it's in parentheses. Luke. Uh, couldn't you just 